Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, everybody. How are you today? This is Tracy Stuckrath with Thrive Meetings and Events and Eating at a Meeting. Today's guest is Eric Wallinger from Meat Green. He's the Director of Sustainability, and he focuses on resources and the environment, allows him to work closely with destination suppliers and planner teams from around the world to integrate sustainable practices into their events and organizations. In 2019 alone, he and his colleagues at Meat Green helped support the donation of more than 29 290,000 pounds of food and the composting of more than 181,000 pounds of food scraps through their events. Holy crap, Eric, that's a lot of food. I want to, uh, hi everybody. I I want to, hearing that you say that number, I wanted to kind of also clarify that a chunk of that was actually um, a food and beverage minimum that was converted to purchasing food. So this was not all wasted wow, food. Okay. So that really boosted that number. Our number next year, if that doesn't happen, right, uh, will be lower. Uh, typically yeah. for those big shows, it's anywhere from eight hundred to two and three thousand pounds for a big, you know, trade show style that, that you sort of see as as food waste. So okay, so let's go back to that one thing that you were clarifying. So two hundred ninety thousand pounds of food. And that was because the food that was made to meet the food and beverage minimum that planners have to pay unless to get free meeting space. Is that right? Yeah. And so how can we combat that? Well, things change so much in, um, in our events, as we know, as planners, Uh um, and the things, it seems like at the bigger shows where you've got, um, multiple venues, there is, you know, the, the, this group of people isn't meeting over there and you have kind of committed to spending X, X, Y, and Z. And typically that just gets reabsorbed by the venue as like a penalty. Um, and so making that case that that will be, that that could be converted to food donation. And especially now in sort of a post COVID uh-huh. world, that might be even an easier sell, at least in terms of safety, who could argue with just sort of buying sealed right. food, but also these venues you know, maybe motivated more to kind of uphold, you know, sort of extract every dollar, who knows, but that opportunity is available. And I think 2020, 2021 would be great opportunities for us all to see if we can sell them on that idea. Yeah. I think COVID has actually, with seeing the news stories of farmers retailing their, their crops into their land and, you know, our convention centers, donating and i know mgm was really big at donating what they had in the refrigerators and the freezers to food banks you know hopefully that helps eliminate that oh well we can't do that because we don't want the liability statement of donation yeah i i am curious to see um we 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 haven't seen that as being the primary concern sort of still if it hasn't sort of left the back of house piece. Uh Um, And we haven't seen a lot of event evidence right now. We're still in that very closed summer of 2020 period. Um, So we're guessing a little bit, but um, we know that um, demand on food banks has gone up by about 40% uh, nationally. And we also know that typically they have been fed by, you know, your sports arenas, our hotels, our restaurants, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes from our local homes and so forth, but it's really that commercial event sector that has been a huge piece of that uh, supply chain of food. Yeah, definitely. And, and 
I think some of the stuff that when when COVID first hit, it was really startling to me, you know, all of that stuff that was going to waste. And I'm like, we've got these big kitchens, we've got these large facilities and the staff in, in an essence before they were all like furloughed, you know, to make food, to serve to these food banks and provide to these food banks so that people weren't going hungry. And and I know that a lot of our our partners have come into that realm of donation. So it's really exciting to see, but there's so much more that we can do, but it, it doesn't, we don't realize, I don't think people realize that a lot of that's donations from the food banks does come from our industry. And I don't think our industry even knows that. I, I agree. I agree that this will be a real, um, as with a lot of things related to food yeah. safety and sustainability, it's gonna be kind of a, a real re-education happening and needed. Yeah. In the next couple of years. So I've, I've given a couple of webinars over the last six weeks and the one of it, it, the topics have come in under the questions have come under topics of, you know, how do I manage dietary restrictions? Of What are your biggest concerns and what are your biggest um, what do you want to know about? So it's dietary restrictions. How can we be sustainable, you know, in light of COVID and food safety, and then just food safety in general. So can they mesh? <laughs> can food safety and food sustainability work hand in hand? I, I believe they can. Yeah. Um, I I believe, and I think, and I believe Meat Green models this as well, that um, it kind of has always been the case in sustainability that, okay. you know, the first Earth Day in 1970, it was a big, kind of safety piece of that, that our planet would be habitable um, in, you know, to moderate, to present times. Um, mm -hmm. Just in January of this year, Larry Fink of BlackRock Capital um, sent a letter to investors that sustainability was now going to be considered a key risk assessment piece. So every BlackRock kind of portfolio addition would go through a rigorous uh, sustainability vetting as well. And wow. that's a first there. And so it's linked with risk management. When you look at the World Economic Forum, uh, this is just January of this year as well, um, projecting out over the top 10 risks of the next decade, mm -hmm. uh, five of those falling into environmental. So 50%. Wow. So, um, you know, this isn't just a sustain people passionate about sustainability off in the corner trying to prove this. This is coming very much from our investment side. This is coming from sort of our global thought thought leaders. But in terms right. of how, how that can look, um, we're often seeing the more sustainable choice, just sort of eliminating extra touches, extra things, and that production uh -huh. of extra things. Um, so, so there's that. I can give some more, more examples. Um, um, so, like, in terms of plastic bottles, okay, um, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of sealed water bottles and so forth. But many of the water filling stations that we're seeing in venues are relatively touchless. You put something in, you don't even have to push mm -hmm. a button, then it comes down. Um, you know, if we all brought our own bottle and we all sort of sanitized our hands, uh huh. Um, we believe that um, that stands a chance that there that could be equally as safe. Uh, seems right. like the messages that we're getting um, from CDC data at present is that the primary vector of COVID transmission is sort of person to person relating to respiratory right. droplets over a sustained contact or over a sustained period of time. Right. Um, surface transmission, while there is evidence, and I'm not an expert, but what I'm reading is that right. it's sort of a secondary and sort of a less pressing sort of vector of transmission. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a hard sell for us all to kind of walk in and tell these venues that kind of argue right from the get-go but i think having this in the wings like once we get our sea legs under us right once we see events happening we we and we see them going off really well that we can really make that case for um uh there's areas like water bottles areas like um uh packaging we may not need everything hermetically wrapped we were we were talking about this earlier when we were just uh -huh. sort of warming up for for this but if you follow a plate coming out of a dishwasher that's been washed at temperature um, with various chemicals and right. um, considered sort of sanitary, 
um, that's touched once coming out, put on a rack, if it's sort of going to be given back to you again with food on it, um, that will be a touch a total of two times. And if you're being given a box of pre-wrapped things, that will be touched one time. And so when you take that into the context of that you've flown there, staying in a hotel, probably ridden public transportation and met with a bunch of other people, you know, it's, yeah. that, that's, it that puts that in perspective. Right. Uh, again, I'm fully anticipating cautious to the nines and we probably won't be able to argue that down on event number one, but right. if we're all prepared to sort of make our cases after we've gotten a next level of data back, I think we can kind of walk back some of the less sustainable pieces. Yeah, and I think the water jug thing, and when I first, um, actually my my airport here in New Bern, North Carolina, I posted, this was a couple of months ago, they had just gotten that touchless water thing. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so excited for this because I was having to buy a bottle of water because it was the old fashioned water fountain, which you can get, barely get any water into your water bottle from. Um, so they switched it out and a friend of mine is like, well, you need to wipe that down before you use it because of all of the germs. And I'm like, okay, okay. I, it, that kind of went over my head. I, I was like, really? Um, but I think that the water bottles that we see in banquet rooms where you have to actually touch the lever, you know, and how can, you know, hotels, instead of just putting them at the bathrooms, those touchless things, can they put those in each of the ballrooms? I mean, you can't do it on an air wall, but um, you could potentially do it. If you have it on the outside wall, why can't you put one on the inside wall of a hard wall? I, I agree. And this would be, yeah. I mean, a great driver of certain retrofits. Yeah. Um, we're also have, are seeing in smaller events, and we're not seeing many events right now, but the smaller right. things that we're seeing, um, we have seen examples of sort of a dedicated water server. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. For those events um, that are water not. Water barista. Yeah, a water barista. And so it's kind of coming from that central. Yep. Central point. Yeah. And, and having that person serve and, and, you know, it's a water bar or water, whatever. So you could potentially have really a lot of fun with that. Um, and, I, I like the idea, though, of not having pre-poured water and iced tea on every single buffet on every single table. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another example of where something that would have been the most sustainable in any in any environment five right. years ago or, or today is also sort of the more sust uh, sustainable and safe option now. Yeah. And you guys have a checklist, right? On the website? We do, um, on meetgreen.com. Uh-huh. Um, and what we did is we meet green for every event that it works on, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a sustainability consulting event or, or event planning. Uh-huh. Um, we apply a total of uh, 16 minimum um, sort of initiatives. Many of them can be sort of small in some eyes, but you know, requesting the donation of food. Right. It's not rocket scientists, but that's something that we request and kind of push for every every event. So we had 16 of those. And one of the ways that we tried to manage our own internal expectations of what might happen is we took those and looked at how they would track in a in our anticipation of a COVID reopened world. Okay. And we found of those 16, we could make the case um, that 14 of those 16 could proceed ahead. Wow. Two of them would um, fall into kind of a yellow use caution. One of those yellow right. use cautions was around condiments. Uh, okay. uh, we believe uh, that there are ways to kind of continue to use bulk condiments, um, especially sort of in, in light of the idea that you have now gone to an event and sort of entered the world, uh, as it were, and sort of sanitizing your hand before entering a food, food right. court, having your temperature checked and all that kind of thing would kind of kind of put you in a place where that's why it kind of puts it in. It's possible. It's probably not going to happen right away. Right. And we're, and we're happy to sort of, you know, not push too, too hard there. Um, but what I want to kind of follow this up with is, you know, we're leaning in here and I have my own biases of being in the events industry, loving the events industry and looking for every reason for it to be the most sustainable it can. But right. we're also trying to balance that with the way that the CDC tends to communicate, um, key transmission and risk, 
But we found a couple of weeks after we published this that um, I have a copy of it here with, with me. Um, I just posted the uh, link online, so, but uh, show us, yeah. Oh, um, the uh, 119 health experts uh, <laughs> from across the globe, from 18 countries, actually signed a um, statement basically um, supporting the use of reusables at events. Oh. And um, and it's really neat when you look at the end of who, who the signatures are. I mean, some of it, it's from all over America. So it's not sort of like the university of environmentalists. You know, it's right. it's it's really a cross section of a lot of different states. With uh -huh. some, um, some institutions also that, um, you know, are pretty prestigious and so forth. But um, let's see. I don't know if I'm prepared to really quote a ton, but so basically that one of the take homes is sort of based upon best available science and guidance from public health professionals. It's clear reusable systems can be used safely by employing basic hygiene. So it's kind of back to what we talked yep. about, but um, it's something if we want to post it as a resource after this event where he can yeah. do that as well. Um, and again, I fully expect um, you know, it, it to be the venue sort of coming, coming back as comfortably as they can, they have to manage their liability, manage right. the risk. Mm -hmm. Um, but we should, I'm fully prepared to kind of document this process as events reopen, looking at where are those areas that we can make some headway mm -hmm. and kind of in the next event cycle, seeing how comfortable everywhere and is seeing where the science has fallen. Right. Um, you know, a year from now, six months from now, um, and continuing to make that case as we always have. Right. Now, um, talking, I, my head went back to plastics. Yeah. So um, let's talk plexiglass. You know, <laughs> I posted a picture the other day of my YMCA and they hung plexiglass screens basically along the registration desk and, you know, putting those up at buffets and how, and I, you know, I was talking to Exhibit House. I'm like, have fun with them. You know, if you're going to put the plexiglass up, you know, use writable markers on there and so that you can announce the dietary needs of the food that you're being served or the, that server can write their name or, you know, have fun with it. But that plexiglass is that, I'm assuming those are all going to be reusable, right? And those, have you seen venues or heard of venues buying that to install that into buffets or? I am going to um, uh, be very excited when I see my first buffet uh -huh. coming back. I, I really feel like that's going to be the slowest. I, I feel yeah. like it's going well, yeah, to. Um, but action stations with servers, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, and having that, that, barrier there yeah <laughs> yeah um i i mean we see that sort of at our, everything from our local starbucks to right. you know, our grocery stores now yeah um yeah that those will will be very reusable but we are seeing a tremendous increase in plastic i mean anyone on this call can google this right now there's still not a a great number out there for how much has it increased but the, right. the la times published an article maybe two weeks ago uh -huh. um, and Thailand had come out with a study, and I believe that they saw, have seen a 30% rise or projecting a 30% rise uh -huh. um, in plastic overall increase in in, wow. um, in this year. So normally we'd see sort of a 1% to 2% fluctuation one way or another. But, okay. but um, from April 2020 to April 2019, April 2020 was up 62%. And so that's a data point that we got from Thailand. Um and I believe the uh, World Economic Forum right. also published that um, they're product predicting plastic production to increase by a third over the next five years. That's a lot. Um, oh, my God. Uh, and here's the crazy part. And triple by 2050. Um, so that's the World Economic Forum. That's, that's a... For, that's scary. Uh, for those of us who are thinking about sustainability, it's it's a real head spinner. I mean, we were kind of going along uh, quite well and right. uh, it, it is a setback. Right. So 
the I was going to try to put up. I don't know how I can. I've never done this before, so I was going to see sh share a screen to show this picture layout. All right, I'm going to share my screen to your checklist real quick. I'm going to try this. Um, if this works, sustainability. There, can you see that? I do not see your screen. Oh, okay, never mind. I don't know how to do this. We'll hit cancel. Okay, we won't do that. We'll go back over here. Um, cause I was going to share your checklist on what that was, because when we're thinking about, you know, getting rid of the plastics and you and I were talking about silverware and you were talking about reusable. So if you can clarify for planners, you know, rolled silverware to be washed versus reusable silverware. So to me, rolled silverware is reusable, right? Yeah. But so talk about the difference between that and the reusable that you're mentioning. Um, um, one thing about the, the checklist piece, if you go to meetgreen.com, um, probably the quickest way is blog. You can click uh -huh. that and it's listed there too. And it's uh, sa okay. safety and sustainability is, is the one. I put the link in one of the Facebook groups. So cool. make sure. Yeah. Um, well, we're likely to see a single use disposables sort of increase is what we're right. we're in anticipating. Um, one of the things people don't always think about in this, and one of the things that this paper from the scientists highlighted is the downstream impact. Okay. Uh, when you sort of throw something out, um, that that has implications as well uh, of transmission and sort of kind of COVID pollution <laughs> COVID, right. uh, spreading as well. So, um, you know, there are not many silver bullets in sustainability. Um, there's always a trade-off somewhere. We were talking about this before this call that um, things like aluminum, where it's infinitely recyclable um, and easy to extract in a waste system, also has one of the highest carbon footprints. And so depending what your sustainability priorities are will drive how much you want to use aluminum. Because in that way, plastic would be the smarter choice if carbon was your sole metric. Okay. Uh, so, um, Anyway, there's all kinds of trade-offs up and down the line. And the one thing that we feel the most comfortable about is reusables, is the kind of best practice silver bullet, um, likely to receive a little bit of resistance up front with these events. But we okay. talked about, we believe that we can make the case after a little bit more data is in um, that it will be safe. There will be a sort of a minimum of extra touches, but we're finding that many of these pieces uh, such as um, porcelain plates and cups and right. um, silverware are used thousands of times. I mean, we don't have the magic number, but from a little bit of light venue sur uh, surveys that we've done, it's right. in the thousands of times uh, with very minimal breakage. Uh, breakage is not a substantial issue at these venues. Um, okay. And um, they are more resource intensive to create on the upfront, on the up. Stream side. Uh, which one, the porcelain uh, or the re? Uh, uh, porcelain. So when you're making sort of a physical, sort of like durable, multi right. object, um, that does use uh, quite a bit more resources, energy, carbon to produce. But when you hit a break-even point, right? Um, after about forty uses, uh, which is easily done at most restaurants and venues, <laughs> um, that is a slam dunk. You you've kind of ridden off into the the sunset in terms of the most sustainable option. Uh, plastic is popular because it's cheap to make. Right. Um, and you will see people who make the case that styrofoam cups have a lower, <laughs> but that's not telling the whole story. Right. Um, and that I think that's one of the hard things too, is telling that whole story because I think you have a give and take with anything that you choose, right? In any decision that you make in life, but in sustainability, it you have to... I think it was Mariella that says, you know, let's look at maybe this one thing. You can reduce your paper at your event, right? How much paper you use at your event. But so you're going to save money on that and to save on sustainability to offset maybe something else that you have done, right? And you can think of that as actually air flying carbon offsets, right? I'm flying to this event and I'm going to pay for some carbon offsets. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's the the field of kind of carbon calculation, especially for events, yeah. tends to be around combustion. Like when you get when you look at your carbon footprint, but what we're what we're trying to do at Meet Green is 
make the case for the clients that we're working on that um, highlighting carbon savings across across the board. Um, okay. And one of those areas might be, you know, back to kind of diet, you know, when you were talking about sort of menu and diet sustainability, mm -hmm. uh, protein, uh, you know, we, many of us yep. need protein, um, but also might have a restriction around the kind of protein that we, that we get uh, or, or would choose. And, um, you know, if you are able to reduce the amount of red meat in your diet, you right. are really uh, able to have tremendous environmental benefits in terms of water savings, energy savings, carbon savings. Um, and whenever we run a number like that for a, an event at any kind of scale, the numbers are just wild. It's really? a lot more than you would think. Um, yeah. So just know that that's on the table for you. And although you're not getting the credit you should in your carbon okay. footprint, um, cause we're finding that these material choices, food choices, um, lots of different choices are saving carbon, the, our ability kind of as a industry, it's not just the events industry, but just sort of the sustainability industry uh -huh. is not sort of taking those into account, uh, quite in the same way. So we're, we're, we're making the case in reports and so forth, but the, the model is not really there yet to kind of fully tease that out would be my opinion. Okay. And, you know, before we got on, I was, you know, talking about, you know, the food and, and I, um, Heather Herrig is on here. So, or, um, so hi, Heather and Julie and Jeannie and who else is on here? Lori and Adrian and Susanna. Thanks for being on, being here. Um, Heather and I had a conversation a couple of months ago when we watched all of the food being tilled back into the farmland because the farmers had no place to take it. And, you know, there's two college kids started a company um, called F the Farm Link Project, and they're going and picking up, they called farmers and rented a truck and went and picked up that food and delivered it to a food bank. Heather and I were like, okay, so what do we do? And I'm like, okay, I'm not 20, 20 years old, apparently, <laughs> but they figured it out. But I think too, is that um, talking, so it's the sourcing, lo I'm getting to my point of sourcing locally. And in some of my webinars, I was talking about apples and, you know, an apple falls from the tree and that farm worker touches it and puts it in a truck and that truck goes somewhere else. And then it touches, go to the grocery store or to the food, to Cisco or U.S. Foods, and then it goes all these other places. But we can reduce it and be more sustainable by sourcing that apple locally or source not necessarily the apple but sourcing more things locally that are in season and can you talk about that a little bit i mean it's going to raise our prices right because it is more organic or will it um it doesn't have to uh okay. in, in, impact pricing but it's another example and it's actually on our meat green safe and sustainable list of where sort of the more sustainable choice and under any environment is also the safest one in a covid environment okay. Uh, as you mentioned, it's just sort of less handling, um, less possible uh, places. You're sort of more in touch with your region, presumably, right. than whatever is happening um, globally. But um, we've seen statistics that by keeping your spend within the region, and typically we define a region as 250 miles. Okay. Although you could, um, in, in areas like Las Vegas, we'll extend that out to a 500-mile region because the growing um, region is sort of limited in that part of the country, but, um, your spend is actually magnified three times, keeping your money locally. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So you're doing social good. You're having social impact. Um, you're also, um, you know, so you could be supporting businesses, minority owned businesses, um, small businesses, right? Uh, all businesses of all kinds. So you're putting your dollars to work that, that, could have social impacts as well. You're magnifying your spend, you're uh -huh. eliminating touches, and you could be eating more seasonally as well, which would have sort of, um, you know, instead of growing something, you might be right. reducing the amount of water, for instance, yeah. that you needed to produce an apple if it's in season. Yeah. So I could ask you, all right, not could, but so what are two, one or two resources that you could share with, um, everybody here on how to be more sustainable and safe. I've already posted the link to the, your safety and sustainability in 2020 
link and I'll make sure that it's in in the eating in the meeting Facebook page as well or group as well. But anything else? Yeah, uh, I'll, I think we should. I'll, I'll circle back to you with a link about the um, positions. Okay. Because it's sort of like helps credential it a step further than just the sustainability team or those passionate about sustainability. Uh -huh. sort of making this case kind of you have some medical establishment there too. Um, but you know, outside of safety a little bit, but just sort of what might be interesting to your um, listeners, there's a there's a part of Meet Green site if you type in my event footprint. Okay. It's kind of an impact I'm calculator. Right. I'm going to put that in there. Okay. Um, I think this is fascinating for communicating. I think it's a really big part of what um, your work does, Tracy, which is communicate, help educate people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's what we're all going to be having to do more of coming up is education um, yeah. and telling that that story. But you can play with it a little bit. Number of days for your event, number of people. Don't okay. use commas because that sort of breaks it a little bit. So okay. tinker with that and tinker with going through once and answering yes or no through the questions and uh -huh. then tinkering answering no to all the questions and yes to just a couple that you're interested in, like um, eliminating water bottles or that kind of thing. And it gives you a readout of your carbon, energy, and water. Okay. It's part of that sustainable storytelling, choosing chicken over beef, that sort of st things. Right. And, um, you know, you can do that if you have a, a thousand person meal and everyone right. serves chicken over beef. So it's just part of, it can assist your storytelling. And the last resource, I recommend visiting the refed site. Okay. Um, I mean, just landing on their main page, it's just a sea of data. So if you're looking for data to support kind of reducing food waste, uh -huh. uh, trends in the industry, and one of the top best practices they list on that site, again, is education uh, to combat all this. Right. I recommend paying a visit to uh, their site as well for someone who's taking it to a really great level. Okay, cool. And I actually, um, I'm going to be interviewing somebody from Refed next month. So Amazing. I'm a meeting planner. So I'm excited to chat with them. Um, any last minute thoughts on what we can, how we can do this and encouragement to planners? And how can they find Meet Green? Well, um, Meet Green is, is the easy part. You know, just <laughs> um, if you type anything like sustainable events into the internet will come up, um, uh -huh. meetgreen.com. But yeah we we would love to to help you in your storytelling your work your coming back your event planning um but just in terms of the industry i mean i think just supporting each other it has been this is not the year any of us expected yeah. and um trying to do our best to you know help our fellow planners uh help people at the venue keep our um enthusiasm up Mm -hmm. and um, try and educate ourselves around ways that our industry can can convene virtually or physically. Um, yeah. I mean, it, I think we definitely need to encourage everybody amongst ourselves on how to do this and, and to bring meetings back safely. And it's, it's important. And, and I said to you earlier, I'm like, and in my webinars, food safety has always been there. It's just been behind the kitchen door. And we need to knock that kitchen door down and talk to our food and beverage partners about this. But the same thing with sustainability. I mean, it, sustainability necessarily hasn't been there all the time, but companies have probably been doing it and they haven't been communicating what they're doing. So I think combining that conversation and communicating it out to our attendees is super important as well as to our planners. Completely agree. And one of the best practices that links with what you're saying um, is a back of house tour. Um, yeah. making sure that when these events come back, that your lead event stakeholders um, <laughs> are make, you know, allowing 15, 20 minutes to walk with um, your director of food and beverage, your event manager, um, and so that you can help assure your stakeholders that um, it's been verified. Yeah. And actually, one more question I have. A lot of planners get the pushback, and, and hopefully this is going to change because of COVID that, hey, we can't donate because we don't want the liability and you know we don't want that. What recommendations do you have for planners to get around that? Well, um, we always kind of put people back to the Bill Emerson Act. So this was a, a law, uh, kind of a yep. good Samaritan law that came out during the Clinton era. And there has never been one case filed against this. So this is- Really? Yeah. Um, so it's not like there's just a sea of lawsuit precedents that have come out. There's not been one uh, Bill Emerson Act kind of, um, at fault 
Okay. Um, decision. So you are technically protected, but a lot of our organizations, our hotel chains, our venues, right. want to exceed sort of any threshold. Um, and so knowing that you are protected, uh, number one, um, citing things about that, especially especially in the beginning where it's a sealed kind of thing, right? Um, you know, citing the need from from food banks. I don't see that going away anytime soon. No, I don't either. Uh, citing the kind of very low risk. Um, CDC's own data seems to be person to person sort of sustained contact rather than a, a box that's been sitting behind, right? You know, back of house, uh, likely in a refrigerated environment, uh, and also sort of what we talked about earlier, which is um, converting those food and beverage or any of those penalty pieces, convert that to good if you can. Okay. That's a great idea. I like that. Um, so it, taking managing your food and beverage minimum and taking what you didn't serve and donating it for sure. Yeah. Uh, buying, buying canned food, uh, yeah. buying protein. Yeah. There's a couple of stories that I saw right when this hit that they were canceling their events and they were going to be charged only the food and beverage minimum to cancel. And the planner is like, okay, fine. And then a light bulb went off and she's like, you know what? Nope. I want you to make that food and I want you to go donate it. And, you know, so that they were giving back to the community that they weren't actually coming to. And I love that concept and, and how can we continue to do that with our events if necessary? And it will be hard, I think, too, with our properties you know, that are still furloughed you know, and having the staff to make that food. But if we can make that work, I think that model is a good one when we're still canceling meetings. So, unfortunately. I, I agree. And I'm curious to have this conversation six months, nine months from now. Okay. Where we presumably have a little more data, too, and see yeah. how some of this shakes out. Yeah, that would be awesome. Okay, cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. And, Eric, thank you so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate it and all the work that you all do. Um, meetgreen.com. And this is the Thrive Meetings and Events and Eating in a Meeting podcast. And we will see you next week. And we're going to talk about independence and accessing um, different spaces for people who have different disabilities and how do you access those spaces even in a COVID world. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrath, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me, and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.